so again, Lunch and Learn kind of grew out of the COVID when we met virtually for our M3s, and I was looking for a way of continuing sort of this online community and this online connection, especially for people who may not be able to make in-person events in the city, or we actually added members from outside of the New York region. So still to be able to develop and bring people together is my goal of this. And also, as I said, mention um, giving topics that are relevant to us as business leaders and business owners. So with that, um, I would like to introduce our presenter today, who's Graham Murray, founder of Lookout Design, who's a web agency uh, focused on delivering internet solutions for small businesses since 2004. He brings experience with telecommunications and the advertising industry and combining his creative drive with technical background. And he's actually co-presenting with a colleague of his, Eitan Tashe, or Tashi, and who will be giving part of the presentation as well. And we're looking at really today on <clears throat> What, what it means for websites to be ADA compliance, the legalities around that, why it's important, and what we all need to know in that area. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Graham. And is this you presenting, Graham? No, that's not my screen. Yeah, I don't know who somebody, somebody is, uh, has, take, has taken over. Yeah. Let's see if I can. Let me see if I can get rid of this. Okay, wait. Let me see if I can do this. Okay. You should be able to to bring up your screen now. There we are. Okay. So. Okay. Can you see that now, or? Yep. All Great. looks good. Okay. So take it away, Graham. So a few months ago, I met Jerry at um, at an event, and I said I'd like to talk about. ADA compliance. And uh, I said, I'm actually so excited about ADA compliance, which is, um, he said, okay, what's that about? <laughs> I said, well, it's, it's allowing people with disabilities to have full access to the internet. And when you think about ADA compliance, it's sort of like compliance is legalese, it's, it's regulations, it's government, it's, it's law. But the real heart of this is how do we make websites available to people who suffer from disabilities that make it difficult for them to view those websites? So what uh, the basic things I want to cover here are uh, what are the, you know, what is web accessibility? And then what are the laws around that? And those are very specific. And then also I want to talk about what are the litigation risks? And as a small business owner, are you subject to litigation? Uh, if you own a website, what do you need to do to make your website compliant and avoid or mitigate the risk of litigation? And, and I'm going to stop you one quick second, Graham, before I forget, just I wanted to introduce Kelly and have her say a quick minute. Oh. I just realized, um, and then in case you can't stay on the call for the whole thing. So Kelly wants to say our new executive director, um, just to say a quick hello to the team, to the group. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. I'm I'm looking forward to to getting to meet all of you, but there, I don't want to take any more time. I want to hear what Graham has to say. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, and uh, I'll stick around the whole time so we can chat at the end. But Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, so then what I want to focus on is the market opportunity. There's a huge market opportunity, which I think is unrealized. And I want to go over, because I think most of us are small business owners. So I want to talk about the considerations for small business and some benefits. And then also talk, uh, then I'm going to actually have Eitan take over and do a a, a quick demo of the actual technology, what it's like to see a website that's accessible and a website that's not. So that'll give you a pretty full picture of everything. So when I look at, um, when I think about accessibility, you know, we, we think of, I put up the title here, the digital world requires more than wheelchair access. Now, I don't want to take anything away from someone that is physically disabled and needs 
to use a wheelchair because I had an uncle that suffered from multiple dystrophy and um, he became a quadriplegic in the end. And he relied on just to live a normal life or as normal as possible. He relied on being able to get into buildings to be able to get wheelchair access into a restroom. I mean, he wanted to go to a restaurant or a theater or watch a movie or travel on an airplane. And years ago, the world was not very accessible. It was very difficult for him and he struggled. So what I, I saw that firsthand, I saw how difficult it is for someone that has a disability. And I think we can all relate to that. You know, the LGBT community, uh, we, we sometimes have health challenges. We know people who have health challenges. And actually, even more than that, we, um, we're all, we are always excluded or we're, we're striving to be included. So think about it from the user perspective that someone that has disabilities, can they, are they being excluded from the world in some way? So when it comes to websites, the, these are the, uh, the conditions, the, um, the disabilities that most uh, impact uh, website users. Visual impairment, there's really three categories. Visual impairment, people who are blind, partially blind, they may have even just something like blurred vision or they might be getting old like some of us and they need to see larger type. Um, so the visual impairment is a big part of that. There's also cognitive disabilities, people that have epilepsy, autism. Um, those are uh, ADHD is another example. They have a difficulty also navigating websites. And then there's motor and mobility. People who have problems with fine motor skills, they may have lost use of, let's say, uh, think of a veteran, may, maybe he doesn't have the use of both arms. It's not easy for them to use them. They can't use a mouse. Try, try to use a website without a mouse and see how easy that is. So put yourself in their shoes and say, what would it be like if, we, if they could, if you had one of these disabilities. Um, this was really brought to the forefront with COVID because before that, I would run into um, people and say, well, why do blind people need to see, use a website? I mean, that's an ignorant statement, but you know, you, you would hear that. Well, once COVID came, you, can't, you had to do everything online. You couldn't order a pizza or you know, go to an appointment to a doctor's or schedule a vaccination without getting online. And that's the challenge for people with these disabilities. So that's kind of the overview. And what website accessibility does is it's, it's, it's some standards and, and uh, uh, basically design guidelines that are accepted that make it possible to greatly improve the experience that people that have these disabilities can see the website. So what's the big deal? Okay, I'll tell you. Um, the big deal is that 15% of the population in this country has one of those disabilities that I just put up. That's 50 million people. And I, I, I hear that, you know, I hear people talk 15, 20%. I actually did the research. I went in and I took, I went to every, I looked at the disease prevalence or the disability prevalence, people that were blind, people who had all these different things, I added them up and it came to like 14.9%. So that's a real number. And I, I, I feel that's a, that's a big number. It's bigger than you would have thought. So that's the, that's the number of people in this country that are, have difficulty looking at websites. Now, you think, well, most websites are accessible, right? Absolutely not. We are in the early days of accessibility because look at the blue, only 5% of the websites today, of all websites, big or small, are, are actually accessible. 95% of websites are not. That's, that's a huge problem for all those 50 million people. 
So that's kind of the, the scope of it, if you will. So we talk about um, legislation. There, 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 is, there are laws that have been passed. In fact, in 1990, which is, gosh, that's like George W. Bush, <laughs> he, they, they passed the Americans with Disabilities Act. Later, it was amended. And what that requires in law is that businesses have to provide um, equal access and public accommodation to their businesses. And I think the whole focus I talked about, uh, wheelchair access, everyone gets that. In fact, today, you don't have that problem. You go into a major a hotel, a bank, a business, they all have wheelchair access. Um, but now the focus is on websites. So in 2018, standards were adopted and became accepted that uh, those standards would be um, for websites. And that's kind of what we talk about, WCAG 2.1, that's the standard. Um, there are other laws that even go back further to 1973. My gosh, that's like Nixon. <laughs> so there are laws there that the federal government requires as well. Europe is getting on board with this, Canada as well. So it's a really a global thing. Um, so there is litigation out there, but there's no real enforcement from the government. What the enforcement is, is that people, individuals can sue based on the fact that they're disabled and being deprived of equal access. They can sue under this law. And the Department of Justice has uh, supported that and has actually participated or in some cases sued larger companies uh, to enforce this. California is usually kind of a leader in these things, has some additional uh, statutes that they put in place that provides up to $4,000 uh, statutory damages per incident if you're sued. So these, this, that's the legal risk, if you will. Um, the solution we have is make your website accessible and you won't be subject to these uh, lawsuits. And the reason you won't be is because you'll have a validated accessibility statement. And in truth, your website will be uh, accessible. You, you People will be able to navigate and see your website just as, as regular people can, and you will not be subject to those lawsuits. So um, you think that the, the, the I say there's the principle of low-hanging fruit, that is, if someone's going to sue, they're going to find people that are the worst uh, offenders. So if you're not the worst offender, you're probably gonna, you're not gonna get sued. And that's, that's the important part of it. Also, I think the cost of, the cost of responding to a complaint for a small business can be devastating. I mean, thousands of dollars, even just to answer a demand letter or to answer a lawsuit, even if you settle out of court. So <clears throat> we talk about, this is a compliance statement. It actually doubles a, cert, a certificate of performance, and it is what you can give to um, sort of avoid these, these lawsuit challenges. So litigation is on the rise, um, and California is the lead, leads this. New York is probably actually equal in terms of, if you look at the population, Florida. Um, these lawsuits are um, increasing in, in um, both prevalence as well as uh, the awards of damages. And these are also some facts here that there's um, there have been over 150 demand letters in the last couple of years that were served to businesses. So when you get a demand letter, you have to respond to it some way. That means you have to call a lawyer, you have to get your, your counsel, maybe your insurance carrier involved, and that can be expensive. So the average uh, of these demand letters is on the low end, about 10,000 to respond. And on the high end, it can be up to 100,000. And sometimes this goes to trial. And I think what you'll find is that the majority of trials are resolved in the, uh, towards the plaintiff, not towards the business. Think about 
a blind person coming into a jury and saying, I, I'm disabled, I can't, you know, I've been damaged. The business is not gonna get a lot of sympathy from a jury, okay? So that's the litigation side, the sort of risk of uh, mitigating, mitigating, mitigating risk. With the market opportunity, I mentioned that 15% of website users, that's a real opportunity for you. So here's a question I have. Uh, how much do you spend on Google advertising, it's Google, um, you know, organic search, social media, email marketing, any kind of digital advertising? You probably spend some amount of money. You want to increase traffic to your website. You want to get more people involved to buy your products, your services, whatever it is. So what if you could get access to 15% more users? Wouldn't that be worth um, a couple of thousand dollars a year um, because we spend a lot of time trying to get just even one or two percent increase, you know, on the Google search page. And in addition to that, accessible websites will have improved uh, ranking and SEO from Google. And that's that's already the case, but that's going to increase. And I'll give you an example. Years ago, uh, websites were not secure. It was HTTP, and then it was transitioned to secure, SSL. Google actually dinged companies that were not secure, and pretty quickly, everyone got their act together, and over a couple of years, it became uh, secure. Why did Google do that? Because they want to improve the internet. They want to make it more accessible. They want to reduce you know, the, uh, hacking or whatever. Same thing with accessibility. But... Another uh, benefit is brand loyalty. So here's a, you know, there are people that have visual impairments, maybe blind or any kind of impairments. They really appreciate an uh, accessible website, whether they're shopping on it or whatever. Um, and conversely, a lawsuit against your company is probably not a good look. Um, so I have a, I have a, a attorney, a small attorney, and she puts, she has an um, accessible website, and she says she gets clients coming in that are not visually impaired. They just like the fact that she supports disabled people. They, she's gotten business from people that choose her company or her law firm over others because they feel good about it. So that's, that's brand reputation. Um, in addition, for NGLCC members, I know for a fact that large companies, they're, they're trying to promote, you know, uh, equity, inclusion, uh, ESG, these are all hot topics. And I also know for a fact that compliance is, ADA compliance is showing up in RFPs. So I had one um, uh, friend and client of mine who's also a member, and he called me up one day in a panic. He said, Graham, I've got a I've got to respond to this RFP today and they want my accessibility statement. What am I going to do? And I said, I said, Don't, I've got you covered. It's, it's on your website. Here's the link on your website. It's been there for two years. You don't have to just give them the link. And he was able to then submit that with his package. If, if he didn't have that, that would have been a problem for him in responding to that RFP. So large corporations are looking at this. Um, governments are looking at this as well, government agencies. So if you're doing business with those companies, I think they'll appreciate the fact that your website is accessible. Um, I mentioned government. There's actually some more stringent requirements if you're a contractor for a government contractor or if you receive any kind of money grant from the government. Um, now for small businesses, here's another benefit. The government will pay you or not pay you, but will give you a credit, not, not, um, uh, an actual tax credit on your profits up to $5,000 a year for ADA compliance. And, um, they'll actually pay you to make your site accessible, uh, through this credit. So it's form 8826 that's used for 
uh, providing physical, um, you know, modifications to your building, but it also applies to websites now. So um, that's something to think about. And we've got a lot of clients that have been able to get back credit on their federal taxes of up to $5,000. So when we looked at the entire um, solution out there, we chose a system that was affordable because when I first started looking at accessibility, the idea of recoding a website could cost twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars, even on a website that only costs ten thousand dollars to build, and that's because it's a complicated thing. The standards are changing, so we use the system that incorporates um, actually artificial intelligence, and it works as an overlay to your website, and it can be implemented within forty-eight hours, or in some cases even the same day. And it, I've not had a website. I've, about 75% of my clients currently are visa system, and I have not had a website that it doesn't work on. So it's rock solid. The technology works and it can be implemented quickly and it's affordable. And that was a big thing for me because at first I thought no one's going to pay all this money, small businesses, regulations or not. It's just cost prohibitive but we found a solution that actually is affordable. Um, it's a rapid um, implementation process. Again, once this code is put on your website, which we do, we, we make sure it's like fits the brand of your website and Aton's gonna show you that as well. Um, it scans the site and almost, you know, within, we say within 24 to 48 hours, but it can be faster. Your website will be accessibility standards. These are larger corporations that have made the commitment. So you can see, you know, media companies, uh, manufacturers, um, pharma, um, you know, uh, brand, you know, brands like Avon and Kenneth Cole. So all of these uh, companies are, have made that, but it's still surprising to me that a full, um, I would say a full 95% of large companies still do not do this. So this is an opportunity where you can actually be a leader, be ahead of the curve. Um, I've, you know, I've gone to some uh, uh, supplier diversity uh, conferences or attended and while I was online, I would, I would just, all the presenters, I would actually look and I can, I can scan their websites with the tool we have, and I can see if they're accessible or not. And I was amazed. I was just amazed at the number of large companies who can seriously afford this and should not be a problem who have not done it yet. So I look at all this and I say, why am I so excited about it? Because this is a chance to really make a difference. I mean, I love the technology. I love, um, I love, uh, the design aspects of what I do. I love building sites for people, but now I can actually make those websites accessible to people who are less fortunate. So that's my presentation. Uh, I'm going to put this, uh, I've made a PDF of this. I'm going to put it in the chat, which you can download. And there's um, there are links within this document and you can just click on them and you'll be able to download those links um, and or or view them and get more information um, about the, the the topic itself or about the legislation or whatever. We have about 10 or 15 posts on our website that deal with this. So I think with that, I would like to uh, turn it over to Eitan, who's our, our um, accessibility expert, and he's going to actually run through a, a technology demonstration so he can show you exactly what it's like um, with and without accessibility. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Graham. Uh, good to be here with you guys today. So yeah, uh, excited to share uh, a bit more about the tool. And I think afterwards, we'll probably do some Q&A because I'm sure that you'll have questions. 
Um, so yeah, let's get started and just uh, dive right in. Is everybody seeing my screen okay in the meantime? Thumbs up. Okay. Uh, cool. So uh, here you have uh, our accessibility tool. Uh, this is what we use. It has two components to it. Um, as you can see here on this, on our website, it is large, green, and in the upper right-hand corner. So for instance, we've also implemented the tool on a client's website. Here it's purple and in the left-hand corner. So as Grant pointed out, just wanted to you guys to know that it's fully customizable. Uh, we want things to be on brand. We want it to not clash. Uh, with the feel and design that you know the website owner has uh, has has tried to achieve, so that's kind of a very important thing for us. Uh, whatever kind of visibility you want to have with it, we we have quite a bit of um, yeah, quite a bit of leeway there. So let me open it up for you. And first off, uh, you can see here that you have uh, sixteen different languages. So this is both for the interface. But then also, really cool thing, it's for the um, for the what's called an alt tag uh, that uh, that will be generated by our AI line of technology. So what an alt tag is is you know not to get too much into the weeds, but basically uh, how a blind person would navigate a website is they they use assistive technology, so something called a screen reader, which we'll talk about in just a moment, but. What it does essentially is it'll just read a, read aloud the content uh, on a website so that they can navigate, uh, you know, the same as you or, as you or I that they have that contextual understanding there. So an alt tag basically is a description of an image. Uh, it's super important. Uh, this is how people are able to, you know, get around and and you know get by. Uh, for instance, I had a conversation a few weeks ago with a gentleman who's blind. And he was telling me, relating to me his experience, how you know he would go on uh, to a website and he would always purchase you know his food from this website because you know it had all the alt tags there. They came out with like a new design, and he was so frustrated because the actual new design did not take web accessibility into uh, into account. And so when he would tab through the page and navigate using his keyboard, he would just hear image, image, image. That was all that was there. He didn't know what he was on. He was super frustrated and annoyed, and he called the business. But uh, with this tool, so this is going to add all of those uh, alt tags or alternative text. Uh, I'll show it to you in just a second. So yeah, as we were mentioning, 16 different languages. Uh, so you also have an accessibility statement. Uh, as Graham mentioned, this is a super important thing uh, to have. It just states the types of changes that have been made. And again, it's kind of like some documentation. Uh, this is kind of like the insurance policy, right? So, you know, if somebody ever says, hey, what's your guys' accessibility policy? You have it right there. This is your accessibility policy. So uh, let's dive right in. We have a section of profiles and then a number of content, color, and orientation adjustments, uh, which I'll show you. So this is kind of like an accessibility on demand, essentially. Uh, a user could have a unique experience on the website according to their own, you know, needs and background. Uh, some people have colorblindness to a specific, you know, spectrum in the in the light uh, spectrum. Some people have, you know, again, uh, ocu you know, ocular um, degeneration, and maybe they just need content a bit blown up. So, you know, uh, they can go in choose the, the profiles that they need and, and have that experience according to their particular needs. So yeah, let's take a look at them together because uh, yeah, it's fun and very interesting to do. So uh, first off, let's start with the, let's actually start from the bottom and we could start with some of these uh, different, you know, orientations uh, adjustments. So for instance, if I wanted to have a reading guide as I navigate through the page, this would just help a user focus. Uh, you could at, click the reading guide and navigate the page. Uh, in this pic, page, there's no animations to stop, but sometimes you know you get to a page and there's all these flashing GIFs. Uh, you know they can be very distracting, very disorienting to a user, uh, and even sometimes potentially harmful. So think about people who might be coming to your site 
uh, that suffer from epilepsy. Uh, these are the types of elements and the types of things that could trigger a person to have uh, a seizure, which we never want. Uh, so again, there's uh, an option there here to stop animations. Uh, let's see some other cool features uh, there are that I'd like to show you. You can change the cursor, obviously. Uh, you can have a larger cursor if you care to. Again, it just helps people sometimes navigate on the page. You turn it off and it goes right back to the initial user experience that, you know, uh, that you've designed for the client. And then changing the color is an option again. So let's try, let's go with, for instance, an orange. So this is for the background colors. Let's do the text or title colors here. And let's do some text adjustment as well. And so now we've changed everything to, to orange in this case. Let's change, turn that back off. And yeah, some other contrast modes as well that a user could have, again, if that uh, would help them see a high contrast mode. Also some monochrome. Some of these things, again, just help people focus quite a bit. And then, oh, let me turn that back off. Should I just reset here? And then again, uh, we can scale up the content as well. So this is just generally scaling up the content by 10%, 20%, you know, however much somebody really needs. There's the option to change the font to a different type of font. Sometimes things can be a bit blurry uh, and, you know, are difficult to read for people. So that uh, is an option there to do that. Font size again. Line spacing uh, is an option, just again, so that a user could have a more, you know, easy experience on the website. I'll just reset those here and then show you the profiles. So the first is the seizure safe profile. This again, it's gonna stop any moving elements on the page. So think, think of like a flashing GIF things like that. It's going to also dim the colors. So in this case, we don't have any GIFs to show you, uh, but uh, that's what would happen in the, if there were some GIFs on the page. You have a vision impaired profile. Uh, this will scale up the content by 100% and also make uh, the saturation much brighter. That again, a person can just see elements a bit easier. It's just a quick way to turn it on uh, for people here. I actually like this one quite a lot. So this is the ADHD friendly profile. This is also going to uh, scale up the, uh, uh, the content a bit so that people can focus. And let me just escape out of it for a second. But you also have this cool reading mask. Uh, again, if there were GIFs on the page here, you know, flashing uh, news and things, something like that, all of that would stop. But then, yeah, you have this really cool uh, reading mask here that'll help a yeah, somebody just uh, focus on the page a bit. If I turn it right back off, again, it goes right back to the user experience that you've created. And the last uh, adjustment that I'll show you here too is the cognitive disability profile. So what this does is this highlights uh, any uh, headers and clickable links as well. So these are the types of things that somebody would know, oh, okay, if I click on this, uh, it will take me somewhere or it'll do something as well. So just, you know, again, a way that a user could have a bit more of an easy experience navigating on the website. And then for the last two, uh, I'll actually show it to you on this other page because uh, the other page has some really interesting stuff. I'm gonna try to not bore you too much because it's a, a little bit of code, I promise, just a very tiny, tiny bit. Uh, don't fall asleep on me. There's gonna be a test after this. So um, for instance here, if we come to this page and we take a look in the back end. So remember before when I was talking about an alt tag, alternative text for the image. Uh, so in this case, uh, as you can see, there is no 
there's no description here. So imagine that you're a blind person for a moment. Uh, they're coming to the page and they're not, uh, you know, they're not aware of what's going on. Now, once we turn on <clears throat> the AI code, and I'll do that here just from my keyboard, the same way that a blind person would, all of these code changes are gonna populate. So here I turn it on and immediately we have that alt tag there, that description. And this is what's gonna be read aloud through a, user's, uh, through a user's assistive technology, either their JAWS screen reader or there are others that you know, the blind community quite likes. So this is, yeah, this is again, uh, some of the very harder things to code for. Uh, that our AI line of code is taking care of. So we can take a few more uh, looks and examples. Let's just keep looking at a couple other things here. And I can turn off the widget for a moment. And again, take a look at some other elements. So again, here, none of that, uh, none of that coding. Let's turn it back on. And yeah, now we have, again, a nice description here. Let's go back out, look at a couple more elements. So you and I, we know what this is. Uh, these are those social media icons that everybody's using nowadays. Oh, excuse me, that everybody uses. Uh, but a blind person does not know that they don't see that unless it's coded correctly. So let's see how it was coded in this case. So here, this is not very robust coding. So this is not uh, up to the standard of compliance, uh, but it also just doesn't give, give a user any context of what's going on here. So I'll just press a hotkey here again uh, to turn it on. And now, again, all of those code changes populate instantaneously. And again, you can see that it's on because you see the check mark on the, on the widget. And now we have here uh, a bit more robust coding. And this is, again, how they would experience it through their assistive technology, is that this is a new window, it's a clickable link, and that this is the Facebook new window. So all of that's going to read aloud. And a user would then know, OK, if I click Enter here, uh, on my keyboard, on my assistive technology, uh, it's going to take me to a Facebook new window. So yeah, that is really the tool in a nutshell. Um, yeah, as we pointed out, again, it can be customized. Uh, again, here it's purple. Um, on our site, it happens to be green and purple. So both actually can be customized and branded because it's important to be able to, again, have a tool that reflects you and, uh, and isn't clashing with the rest of the site. So um, yeah, that's what I wanted to share. I'm gonna pass it back over to, to Graham and thanks so much. Thanks, Aitan. Um, so I think one of the important things there is that everything is customizable. And once you make those changes, that profile stays. So the next time you visit that website, you don't have to go through all those steps to, you know, it's it's there for you. And I think that makes it um, a much better experience because that part of the brand loyalty, when someone says, I like that site, they really, I, I can really understand what's going on with that site. They'll come back to that site and all those settings will be there. So whether, whatever your business is, I'm sure that's, um, that's really important to be able to, you know, Keep the keep the, keep a relationship going with someone, what you know, whether they're disabled or not. We can do a couple questions now, and then what I'll do is have Gunnar set up maybe um, group. Uh, breakout rooms in pairs, and we'll do like a five minute um, breakup. But let's take one or two questions first while he gets that set up, if anyone has any. I think our uh, media mogul, Sarah Jester, might have a question. They've got their hand up in the chat. Sarah? Okay. 
Sarah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Gunnar. And thank you, Graham, for such a great presentation. My name is Sarah Jester, and I'm the Senior Manager of Digital Media at NGLCC, which is the national headquarters that NGLC NGLCC NY is the satellite New York HQ of. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Um, I'd also like to talk a little bit about digital accessibility in general. I know that uh, for a lot of business owners, I, I can't code. I find coding to be pretty difficult. <laughs> and sometimes coding isn't going to be the end-all, be-all solution to digital accessibility. Um, something that NGLCC has been doing is adding alternative text to all of our images on our website, as well as on our social media, or adding image descriptions between posts that we make. So I'd love it if you could just talk a little bit about some general tips that business owners can follow when trying to make their website more accessible, if say they might not have the uh, time or financial ability to get a service externally. So in terms of this solution, it, there, there is a component to it that, that uses artificial intelligence. And what that means is that uh, the system will scan the website, the page, and if you don't have an alt tag already there, it will then create one per image and based on how it's uh, assessing. Now, we, we, know, we all know that AI is also an evolving thing, but I am a big fan of AI because I think that it's rapidly, I mean, Every year, every 18 months, it's geometrically um, improving in speed and capability and, and so forth. And that's just, that's because of something called Moore's Law. So the quality of those tags is only going to get better. We use AI even in, in our agency for even writing content, helping, assisting in the writing of content. A lot of... Um, the text on our website was initially created or assisted using AI. This system also, when it comes to alt tags, is a great time saver. Because if you don't have time to do that, rather than just throwing up your hands and saying, oh my gosh, you know, I can't, because I know it's it's tedious to actually go in to every single image and make sure you put it in there. But the, um, but the system will create those for you and embed them so that search engines and um, people with, with um, disabilities will be able to see that. And I assume that your main interest is in search engine optimization as well. Sarah, is that correct? Okay. So I, yeah, that's a big thing. Now on our website, we did go through on every single image and, and added them, but I know it's a lot if you, you do not have time for that. So again, um, small businesses are faced with this challenge rather than just leaving them blank, use, a, use an AI-assisted technology to do that, and our accessibility system will do that for you. Great. Thank you. Um, thanks, Sarah, for the question. Uh, Afia, we'll take one more, and then we'll uh, go on to the breakouts. More of a comment than a question. Um, I was diagnosed with ADHD and never really thought of how it affects me utilizing a computer other than the ads and maybe clicking on shoes and not focusing. But when um, Ethan put that border across, I just went like this and I was like zoomed in and I was like, oh my God. And I wrote, this is amazing because I didn't, I think we just learn to deal with a lot of our issues and we learn to um, operate within the constraints of society. And being that this is such a, it can be so bespoke based on what your need is. Um, I just found a solve that I never even knew I needed. Um, I just think the entire uh, program is amazing compared to others that I've seen. Um, it's, it's, you, it's, it's, you can cookie cut it to what you need. And I think with a lot that I've seen, they're missing something. There's one piece or one group they've kind of left out. Um, the amount of options that you have, I just think, I think it's great. I, I'll just comment on that too, is that we started using this about three, three, four years ago. And at the time it was really just visually impaired. You know, that was it. 
And then all of a sudden I noticed these other things starting to pop in, like the, these other capabilities, because again, we, we didn't we didn't create the program where we're using, you know, no one can do this on their own. You would have to spend so much time to create code for that and then put it on every site. So we're using best of class technologies to do this. And, and every month I started seeing more and more features just like that ADHD. And I thought that's fantastic because again, those are real disabilities, but also the standards are changing. They're becoming, you know, um, people are finding better ways to do things. And I know from a web design standpoint, people like to make like designers, like they want to have beautiful websites with very light gray text that's hard to read, very thin. And it drives me crazy because I say, that's the kind of thing you're not taking into account what the experience is for other people. It all looks great from a design standpoint, but you're not looking to get, you know, you're not, is that like great if we want to get a, an award, you know, as an advertising agency or something, but it doesn't help the person who really uses your website. And that's what I like about this system. It, it really has all those features built in and yeah. it keeps growing. Yeah. So thank you, Graham. So Susanna, I'm going to have you hold your question if you can. I'm going to do a quick breakout now, like five minutes is all we need. But I, one of the important things I feel about our sessions is to have a networking. So we're going to give break you into pairs and just kind of go over your, your name, services, um, occupation, and then really what insight you got from today and what action you might take because of it. And then after five minutes, we'll come back and then we'll open it up for more questions and we'll stick around if you have um, if you want to stay around a little bit afterwards. But I want to keep it with the time frame. So if Gunnar, you can set up the breakouts now, that would be awesome. I will do that. And Susanna, I'll make sure that we get to your your question and that we leave a little time. I'm going to do um, I'm going to do eight breakout rooms. So there'll be two. A couple will have like three or so in them. And then we'll have about five minutes in each breakout room. Uh, introduce yourself, talk about your services, about what you learned from the presentation, um, and anything of that nature. All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, I wanted to toss over to Susana, I think, who had a question before we broke out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I had a question regarding the API and compliance. As I, I was talking in the breakout room, I just this week signed up contract with the city to uh, present to the DEP for Rikers Island and a lot of compliance issues happening there, section 508 and everything has to be WC, um, the 2.1 compliance. And then I realized, you know, I work a lot with websites and ADA compliance is a huge thing. Everything I design has to follow it. And, but my end results here, the deliverable is a PDF which yes, it will be consumed online. I doubt anybody's going to be printing this 100 page report, but that PDF also has to be compliant. And I would love to give them the option of having um, something like the um, what we saw online, but on a PDF. Mm -hmm. Is there such a thing? Is that an option? Uh, yes and no. Uh, so we didn't have time to go into the document part of it. But certainly uh, when you're talking about the government and, and really full compliance, um, documents are also need to be accessible. They need to, yeah. And PDFs as well. A PDF is kind of a closed format. It's not like an open website that is dynamic. You know, it's like you make a PDF and then you lock it. So um, they have to be sort of individually dealt with. And we do, and part of, there is, Part of the service mm -hmm. is to do that on a sort of page by page or document by document basis. So we can look at that um, and do that in conjunction with the website. So if you have a PDF that has to be uploaded on your website, then the PDF gets um, made compliant without you having to do it yourself. But, um, but it's not gonna look the same. It's not gonna have all those capabilities and features but there there is a certain standard for documents so, so and there, yes, with yeah. government it's um it's uh it's wcag it's vpat it's just, yeah. yeah so we have also a way to get the uh, help you with vpat as well so that you can be approved or 
certified <laughs> and it is a higher standard than the typical right? yeah I yeah much that. more yeah. um if you have a case study for that that you could send over i'd love to see sure. yeah so maybe you maybe you can yeah. connect offline would be great i'm gonna message you right now yeah okay. so uh, so i'm gonna i'm gonna ask one one sort of wrap-up question from either graham or Aton. um besides the services that you offer which are great what what sort of a general recommendation would you have for people that maybe not are ready to afford your services at this point but still need to kind of want to move into this area what would you what would you suggest is a good thing to do <laughs> i i don't there so here's the deal we, we, we've got us either your website is compliant or it's not i mean we can scan any website if if you have a question about that you send, send, you email me your website and we'll run it through a scan and give you a report that will identify what's good, what's bad, what's ugly, you know, the whole thing. And for you to do the remediation and make that would, would again be cost prohibitive, but we'll give you that information and then you can make that decision. Um, but in my opinion, you, you, you're either the, the the tool will tell you if you're totally non-compliant, you're semi-compliant, or you're fully compliant. So in my mind, if you're not fully compliant, it's either black or white. You okay. can't really even semi-compliant. It's like sounds good. It maybe makes you feel a little better, but to be honest, if you're seventy percent there, that's not really very good, and it will not meet the the standard, the WCAG standard. So. Um, there's really no way around that, but I would be happy to do the analysis and to give you that information on a website by website basis. Okay, great. Is that helpful? That yeah, that's good. So it kind of gives us some some options to work with. Yeah. So we'll stick around for some questions. Let me just wrap up this presentation for anyone who needs to leave. Um, so next month is February twenty third. We have our next lunch and learn, and. We're having Mary Blanchett, who is part of New York Life, talking about different options for retirement, IRA, funding, savings, retirement accounts, what all those are. So that will be information should be coming up. We're just fine tuning the um, content for that. So that should be up on the NGLCCNY website shortly to register. And then um, still see what we have coming up hopefully maybe one on social media in March, we have one um, on leadership and uh, management skills in April, and we'll see where things go. So again, I wanna thank you again for attending. I hope you get a lot out of these. I enjoy doing them. And like I said, if you have ones that you might be interested in presenting, shoot me an email. It's jerrycapist at gmail.com. And I will be glad to kind of talk with you, set up a time and see what we can move forward. So with that, I wanna thank you. And like I said, if people have questions, do you have any final words, Kelly, that you wanna share with the group? Uh, no, thank you so much. I, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Okay. Uh, but I look forward to seeing you all next week if you are local uh, at our um, M3 on Tuesday evening at Grubhub. Great. And anyone who wants to stick on for a couple of minutes that have additional questions, I think Graham said he's able to stay on for a few minutes afterwards and I'll be here. So thank you and um, have a great rest of your day.